All right, in this example, I want to do something similar to what I did in the previous couple of videos, um, except now I want to change the setup. So what we do, we have these two lists of data, the stuff in blue that was given to us. And I think this, the idea was these were the number of books read per year by a bunch of males and a bunch of females. And in the previous examples, these males and females were connected in some sense. Um, I think I said that they were married couples. So I randomly selected 10 married couples and kept track of the husband and the wife and how much they read. And what I want to do now is I want to kind of change this scenario. So instead of thinking about these as having a connection, instead of thinking about this as being dependent data, I want to deal with independent data. And the way that could be given to you is kind of like what I have written here in example two. I don't know if that helped any. Where I'm randomly selecting 10 males, then I'm randomly selecting 10 females. And there's no connection between the two. When I put this first male right here in this list, that doesn't mean that I have to put this female first in this list. Like this list could be in any order that I want. There's no inherent connection between the data. The data is independent. And if you think about what that implies, if these two observations are not connected in any way, it makes no sense to subtract the two of them. Like why would you subtract this four from this three? Why not this eight from this three? Like why would you connect these in the first place? What would this mean if these were just random males and random females? It wouldn't make any sense to subtract them. In fact, when you have independent data like we will in this example, you can't subtract them. You can't change your two lists of data into a single list. We're gonna have to study lists one and two I think is where we put this data last time, by themselves, as opposed to putting them together in some sense, subtraction, to change it into one set. And you're like, ooh, that's gonna make things more difficult. Like when we had dependent data, we could just use t-test and t-intervals, function calculations that I was already familiar with. Um, but what if you have these two samples and you can't change them into one? Well, it turns out there's a way you can do it. You just have to use different calculator functions. All right, so without further ado, I randomly select 10 males, then randomly select 10 females, record how many books that they read in a month or a year, I guess this would be, whatever. That data is shown above. Pretend that's what this says. And then maybe I ask the exact same question as I asked here. Can I conclude with 90% certainty that males read more than females? So exact same question, but you see it's not going to be the exact same answer because all of this was relying upon this green column, which isn't relevant anymore over here in example two because my data is independent. Hopefully I made that clear. At any rate, you're probably wondering, okay, how do you do this? Well, it won't surprise you that it's still, we're gonna follow the same steps as we did before. So we'll start by stating the Nolan alternative hypotheses. And the good news is H not still indicates your null hypothesis and H1 still indicates your alternative hypothesis, but it can't be the same as it was over here. Why? Because over here I talked about the mu of the differences. I referred to this green data over here. But now this green data makes no sense at all because the observations are not connected. I can't subtract them. So I can't have the same null and alternative hypotheses. It will be the same idea. The alternative hypothesis will still be the claim and the claim is still that males read more than females. And the null hypothesis will still be the skeptical point of view. And the skeptical point of view is still that males and females read the same amount. Um, but I have to state them differently. The way I'm gonna state them is in terms of two different mu's, a mu of the males and a mu of the females. What I'm gonna write for my null hypothesis is that mu of the males is the exact same as mu of the females. And for my alternative hypothesis, my claim, I'll say that mu of the males is greater than mu of the females. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it, that we're comparing the two mu's because really we're comparing these two lists as opposed to looking at the difference between the two lists. These should be my null and alternative hypotheses. A comment here. Um, there's no reason I have to put males first and females second. I could say mu of the females equals mu of the males, and mu of the females is less than mu of the males. I think the way it's worded, males more than females, kind of implies you put males greater than females. I think this would be the more logical way to put it, but it'd be correct if you wrote mu f and then a less than sign, mu m. So just FYI, you can get these right by doing them two different ways. Second step, shape center spread. Same idea, we're just going to skip them here. Um, it turns out that they're not the same as they were over here. There's a more complicated formula to calculate the shape, the center, and the spread. And I trust that you could Google it if you ever really needed it. We're not going to worry about that in this class. In this class, we're going to jump straight to the picture. And much like over here, anytime we have a T distribution, we're not going to worry about the classical method and we're just going to do the p-value method. Like we have with all hypothesis testing, we put zero in the middle here. And then you want to find your test statistic. It'll turn out that it's over here on the right and then the p-value. And the way you get those are straight out of your calculator. And you're like, let me stop you right there. I bet I know what to do. I bet I go to test and then t-test, right? No, actually. 
And the reason you can't use t-test is look, if you tried to use t-test and you told it you had data, it'd say, what list is your data in? You're like, well, my data is kind of in two different lists, right? We started, I guess this was in the previous video, by putting the males in L1 and the females in L2. And then L3 was the differences. So in the last video, we could test L3, the differences, and this we can't. And this we have kind of two different lists that we have to tell our calculator. Fortunately, your calculator is prepared for this. It has something called a two-sample t-test. That's exactly what you're going to be doing. Two-sample, because I have these two different samples that I'm talking about. And t-test, because there's no notion of the standard deviation of the population being given. I didn't say, I somehow know that the standard deviation of books read for all males is blank. I'll never give you that information. It'll always be a two-sample t-test. If you select answer, what you'll see is you can do this whether you have data or statistics. Maybe you can imagine a situation where instead of giving you the observations, I said I went out and randomly got up 10 males and the average number of books that they read was 12 with the standard deviation of five. And then I randomly selected 10 females and the average number of books that they read was nine with a standard deviation of 15, I don't know, whatever. Throw some numbers at you. You could put in the average, the standard deviation and the sample size for the first group. And then the average, the standard deviation and the sample size for the second group. And then your claim and then you could calculate or draw. I'll explain what pooled means in a minute. Uh, but in this example, I didn't give you those statistics. I gave you the data itself. So you'll go over here to data. You'll be like, oh, you got the data? All right, what lists, note two of them, is your data in? Well, the males are in L1 and the females are in L2. So that once I put L1 here for list one, I got to remember that my calculator is thinking list one is the males. And if I decide to put my females in list two here, then list two is the females. Frequency is something we always ignore in this class. And then it asks me for my claim. Mu one, which remember list one is the males. Mu of the males is, let's see, what did I write here? Mu of the males is greater than mu of the females. So I'm gonna have to put this greater than sign right here. It then asks me if my data is pooled or not. This is kind of a little technical thing. The short answer is that We'll always put no for pooled in our class. Um, what it's asking you is the calculator is going to calculate a standard deviation. And it's going to use this data to calculate a standard deviation. And the calculator wants to know, should it put all 20 of these observations together and just calculate that standard deviation? Or should it calculate a standard deviation over here and then another one over here and then kind of blend those together in some sense? And what you have to figure out is, well, is there a reason to believe that the standard deviations of the two groups should be the same? Because if you think the standard deviation should be the same, then yeah, pool it, absolutely. But we'll never have reason to believe that the standard deviation should be the same. So we'll never pool it. The short answer is always put no in this class. Then you can either calculate or draw. I prefer to draw when I'm doing the p-value method. So hit draw and it's gonna spit out your test statistic and your p-value. Draws your distribution kind of slow. I happen to know that the test statistic is gonna be over here. So I'm gonna start shading it in already. So I'm eager like that. Uh, gives me a large p-value, almost 29%, and then my test statistic is 0 0.5642, and my p-value is 29%, so 29.03%. Uh, that's enough information to draw, that's all the information I need out of my picture. What I can now do is state my conclusion. And let's see here, my p-value is really large, it's larger than alpha, Recall that alpha was 10% because my level of certainty was 90%. Anytime my p-value is greater than alpha, there's not sufficient evidence. So I guess I can write it again because my p-value, which was 29.03%, is greater than alpha, which is 10%. There is not sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So I cannot conclude that males read more than females. And that is how you do hypothesis testing when you have two different samples and importantly, independent data. So remember, you're only gonna do this if the lists are not connected in any way, if they're independent from each other, uh, then you can use this two sample t-test. Comment here, uh, sometimes this sign gets flipped around. It's easy for I don't know, if, they, if it was worded confusingly, like I'm not gonna try to confuse you, but if it said that females read more than males, but it listed females second, or somehow wrote these in such a way that you got confused and you had these backwards. You told your calculator that the females were in list two and the males were in list one or something. 
If you have a one-tailed test, it's easy to flip this side around. The good news is there's a big red flag that tells you that you flip this sign around. If your p-value is ever greater than 50% in a one-tailed test, just like we saw in the previous example, if it shades to the left of my test statistic, it's a good idea to go back and check the sign on here. Make sure that it really does read the way that you want it to read. That's all I got.